A maximum transmission unit, or an MTU, is the size of an IP packet that you can put through the network from one end to the other without needing to fragment it as it goes along the way. Our networks are so diverse. We have wireless networks. We have wired networks. There are some networks where we're tunneling information within other types of packets. We have different types of mediums that we are using. And each one of those different topologies can use different frame types. And if we send a very large frame through the network, and it's going through a separate network along the way that can't take that size of the frame, it will split it up into smaller pieces or fragment it as it's going through. When that fragmentation process takes place, there's some overhead involved with that. We have to pull the whole entire packet in. We have to cut it up into small pieces. We have to send it to the other side. And on the other side, that device then has to wait for all of the pieces to come back so that it can put it back into its original form and hopefully send it along the way. So if possible, we would like to avoid fragmentation. In fact, there are some applications that will set a bit inside of your communication, inside of the packet itself. That's called a don't fragment bit. And if any device sees this don't fragment bit and it has to fragment, it ends up throwing that packet away. Because if I can't fragment it, I can't split it up and send it along its way, I'm simply not going to do anything with it. So you'll be put into a position where you will have to troubleshoot this. There's many automated ways that systems will use to determine what the best possible size might be for an MTU. But these aren't always something that will work perfectly. These try to take advantage of ICMP. And in today's equipment and today's networks these days, we tend to filter the ICMP protocol for for security purposes or management purposes. So although we would like to be able to have an automated way to have this happen, sometimes it doesn't work out exactly that way, and it becomes a little bit more difficult to troubleshoot. To understand more about cases where fragmentation might occur, it's important to understand how an Ethernet frame is constructed and how this IP data is put into that frame. We build this IP part of this packet by looking and starting here at the top. Let's say we're sending data, and we'll be sending this via TCP. The application that we're using sends and communicates via TCP, so it's going to need TCP data. And what I've done is create the maximum amount of TCP data that I can put into a single regular Ethernet frame. So I can put 1,460 bytes, 1,400 160 bytes of TCP data. And I need a TCP header to go along with it. You can't just send the data. You need this special information in the front that tells you what port numbers it will use and other information and flags that are used inside of that TCP header. And that takes 20 bytes. Well, of course, you can't just send TCP. We need to wrap that up into the IP part of this packet. So we'll stick an IP header on the front. And that IP header obviously has the destination IP address, the source IP address, and some other information within that header. So to be able to send all of that data out, we at least need the 1460 bytes, the 20 bytes, and another 20 bytes of the IP header. And that makes a total of 1,500 bytes of IP information that we would be sending from end to end. Now, if you're on an Ethernet network, then you would wrap Ethernet type information around it. You would have a data link control header at the very beginning of that particular packet of 14 bytes. And at the end is something called a frame check sequence, or an FCS. And that's going to give us a checksum to make sure at the very end, when we see this packet, that there wasn't any type of corruption in the middle. And there are four bytes on the side of that FCS. Now, your challenge, of course, is going to come if we ever need to move this across a network that can't handle this total amount of data, which is 1,518 bytes, 1,518 when you put the Ethernet around it. Now, if it's moving from Ethernet onto a WAN connection, we will pull off the Ethernet header. We'll still have the IP information, and we'll wrap around that whatever type of topology is being used there. Maybe we're tunneling information within yet another IP packet. And that's usually where you start to run into problems when you're dealing with these MTUs is we're taking a full size 1,500 bytes of IP data and we still have to put other IP data around that because it's a tunnel. When you run into those situations, now you really have way too much data to go across a normal Ethernet connection. We're going to have to begin fragmenting that data. And that's why if we're using a tunneled connection, we will often configure our individual systems not to send this much TCP data out over this network at any one particular time. Maybe we want to send smaller amounts of data in that data part of the packet. That way, when we finally get around to tunneling that information, we won't have to fragment that data as it's going through the network.
The maximum transmission unit size is generally configured on a router or some other transmission device that where it is hard coded. It is set in that system and it doesn't change very much. Once you configure a link and you set up an MTU between those two connections, it's not going to be reconfigured very often. So as soon as we figure out what that maximum MTU might be, that most optimal MTU might be, we know it's not going to change very much and we can feel comfortable that it's not going to change week to week or day to day. It's these tunneled connections that usually are going to cause the problems for us. We have a lot of networks these days that are Ethernet end-to-end. -end, so there's very little we have to worry about from an MTU perspective. But if we're changing between topology types, if we're going across a wide area network, or perhaps if we're tunneling information, maybe within an IPsec tunnel across the internet. So we're encrypting it, sending across the internet, and decrypting it on the other side. We, that's where we may run into problems with MTUs, because we're taking an existing amount of Ethernet data wrapping more information around it and trying to send it out over Ethernet. So the tunnel that we may be dealing with might also be smaller than our Ethernet segment for one reason or another. So we have to keep that in mind when we're troubleshooting. If we run into a case where packets are going out and that don't fragment bit is set, then we're not getting any fragmentation out of this. Now what is supposed to happen is we send out this packet. It has data inside of it. We would like to get it to the other side. But now it's going through a smaller network. And normally it would be fragmented, but our DF bit is set. So we're not going to fragment that data. What that station does, that, that router that it normally would be fragmenting this, sees this and says, wow, I can't fragment. It normally sends back an ICMP message to the originating station saying, I'm sorry, I was not able to fragment this. You might want to try something else. And at least your application at that point would know the data did not go through. Unfortunately, we, we take filtering to an extreme with security. And ICMP is one of those things that we almost always filter out. And especially if this link is going across many, many hops, there's a larger chance that this ICMP message is not going to make it to the other side because we're filtering it out. And in that case, our application is going to hang. We're not going to get to the other side, and we're not going to know why. So we're going to want to troubleshoot that link and try to determine how big of a packet can I really make and how much can I send across this network to get to the other side. To be able to do that, we can simply do a ping. There's some parameters in the ping command that lets you manually set the length of the packet, the amount of data you're going to put inside of the packet. And you can also set up that ping so that it will never fragment the data. Well, this means we can start sending it from one router to the other. We can do a trace route, know exactly where our routes are. And now we can start pinging and try to figure out at what point during this communication do we run into a problem with the size of our packets. If you're on a Windows machine, the command is ping-f. That forces it to a maximum size. And you would do a dash L to set the length. The, the ICMP part of the packet and the data to set it to a maximum size would be 1,472. And then you could start peeing other things, like a separate server on the internet. I put in here an IP address of 4.2.2.2. Now, if you find that that doesn't get through, you'll get a message that says that didn't work. You may want to try a smaller size. And then you can try smaller sizes, 1471, 1470, and keep going down from there. So that finally, you'll figure out just how big of a packet can I get through without having a chance of fragmentation occurring somewhere in between. If you're running in uh, Mac OS 10, here's the ping command. You'll notice the ping commands in different operating systems have different command line parameters, but the functionality is the same. We can set a don't fragment bit. We can set the size to 1472 and send it off to that IP address. By looking at the fragmentation, understanding the path of where this traffic is going, and using some of this basic troubleshooting, we can really optimize exactly the path and the size of the packets we're going to send. And we can be assured that our applications will be able to communicate all the way across the network and back again.